Wonderful. Well, yeah, super excited to be here. This is a, a fantastic event. I am uh, ha having all kinds of fun. I think probably like all of you, I'm a little bit going stir crazy, like staring at a screen because I'm a hands-on tactile guy. So I got I got my screwdrivers here with me, and I, I like fiddle as I as I <laughs> sit watching presentations because this is uh, a lot of fun, but also I, I'm a tinker. Uh, so uh, I want to give you a, a little bit of the background to I fix it and kind of you know how we operate. Um, but uh, I, I also want to kind of dive in uh, very quickly to so what we see uh, on the other side. So I fix it. You know we take everything apart. We take apart all of your uh, gizmos. I probably have taken apart many products uh, from uh, uh, people who are here. And I want to share some of the things that we have seen that make a difference in the real world when we are trying to fix things. Um, iFixit is a uh, is a open source repair community for everything. You can think of us kind of like Wikipedia for repair. Uh, we have over 100 million uh, consumers, 100 million of your customers on our website every year trying to figure out how to fix something. Uh, and uh, from our perspective, if you did a good job, uh, the thing is easy to fix. We kind of understand everything breaks. We saw it in the videos earlier. You know, you open the box of the iPhone as you walk out of the Apple Store, you drop it, you break it. That's okay. Uh, it's okay for things to break. Um, and what I want to do, I realize we're, we're talking in the context of improving manufacturing. So I want to connect the dots between what you can do to uh, reduce rework in, in facilities or improve the, the speed and effectiveness of rework. And also uh, you know, tie that into consumers and what we see when we're trying to fix things, you know, usually it's outside of the warranty. And then also what the recyclers see. Um, with the overall challenge of, hey, how can we build a fixable world? How can we build a world where things last a little bit longer? Um, so this is a uh, Starbucks barista. Um, you may be accustomed to the human version of the barista. This is their uh, this is their uh, automated uh, right. This is the the robot version of the human uh, barista. And I got I got given one of these. So the the like it, the great tragedy of running a company called iFixit is that everyone gives you all their broken stuff. So a lawyer in town said, Hey Kyle, I have a broken barista. Will you fix it for me? And I said, Of course, no, I won't. And so he said, Fine, you can have it. So he gives it to me. And then a few, I stuck it in the corner and forgot about it. A few months later, someone else came up and said, hey, you know, will you help me fix my espresso machine? And I said, no, but tell me, what is it? And they said, oh, it's one of those Starbucks barista things. I was like, well, that's cool. I'm not going to fix it, but you can give it to me. Um, so at that point, I had two espresso machines that I knew both didn't work, but that uh, didn't work in slightly different ways. And so if you're a tinkerer, you're saying, aha, I have two things that almost work in two different ways. Maybe I can combine them and get them to work. So I had never taken apart an espresso machine before, uh, and uh, you know they are uh, they're kind of intricate. Uh, it's interesting, you know, they they have a lot more in common with like a medical device, uh, the kinds of silicon tubing and wiring and pumps that you see. I, I've seen on a lot more medical devices. Anyway, um, I just I didn't end up fixing it, but I posted step by step instructions on how to open it up, and other people came along later and said, hey, you know, here's some test procedures. Here's a test procedure for the heating element. If it goes out, here's a place on Amazon you can go and get a new heating element. Uh, and since this guide went up on iFixit, we've had over 100,000 people fix their espresso machines, which is pretty cool because if you think about, uh, like, there isn't really a local espresso machine repair guide that you can turn to. So if consumers can't fix things themselves, um, uh, it's probably going to go into a landfill. And that's not ideal. Uh, unfortunately, this has been kind of the trend in the modern um, you're, uh, the last 30 years, you know, there used to be a TV repair shop in every neighborhood. Uh, there were camera repair shops as recent as 10 years ago. Um, and as designs have changed and as manufacturers have sort of moved toward more, I would say optimizing for that first 12 months of ownership. Um, it has, it has really decimated a part of the economy, uh, and it has kind of significant material consequences. So your traditional manufacturing cycle, and maybe what a lot of you are focused on, is, is more on the, on the manufacturing side here. You know, we, we dig uh, uh, ore out of the ground, we smelt it, we make materials out of it, we make products out of it, uh, we use it for a little while, and then we toss it away. And who cares where away is? Well, I spend a lot of time in the away section talking with recyclers. Uh, recyclers will come to me and say, hey, Apple's got a new tablet or a new watch. How do we recycle that? Um, and uh, it's very, very rare that product designers go to the recyclers and say, hey, can we help you figure out how to recycle our products? I would encourage all of you to do that. It's a really eye-opening experience, and they're all very friendly. They would love to talk. Um, so what I'm trying to do is catalyze 
a, a, a circular economy where we can focus more on loops and, and uh, re reusing these materials. If we could get more of a uh, uh, design for recycling in at, at the beginning, it would be fantastic. I'll tell you the, the scrap recycling industry uh, has a actual award. They have a design for recycling award every year. Uh, Dell has won it a few times. Uh, it's it's kind of embarrassing how few applications they get for their design for recycling award. Uh, so if you if you dive into any of this and you get excited and you do uh, and make some product changes, I would encourage you to apply for Israel's design for recycling award. Uh, it's a it's a cool trophy you get to put on your desk, and it's it's important to uh, it's important to set the stage for products that are straightforward to recycle. Um, unfortunately, most of the material impact, if you look at carbon footprint, if you look at just watts into the product, if you look at raw materials, most of that is embodied in the product uh, all the way through lifespan. If you if you were to take your laptop and upgrade to a laptop that was 50% more energy efficient, uh, say like Apple's new M1 uh, laptops are, are highly energy efficient, uh, it's going to take 12 years for the energy efficiency uh, from the use phase of that product to outweigh the energy embodied in manufacturing. So if we're thinking about climate change in the context of our products, uh, yes, you can eke out some efficiencies in the product, but really what we need to focus on is making fewer products that are higher quality that last longer. And that's what product repairability is all about. Uh, so iFixit has been you know, doing teardowns for a long time. We score products from one to 10 uh, with how much we like them. Uh, it's a uh, uh, fairly intensive metric. Uh, we, you know, we, we disassemble them. I've got our iPhone 12 sitting over here in the room that we, uh, that we did this analysis on. The iPhone is actually toward the high end on the smartphone realm. Uh, but I do actually have here with me uh, three different smartphones. So this is the TerraCube, and I have um, I have this is the um, this is the Purism. This is like a Linux-based smartphone, and I also have a Fairphone here with me. So these are three modern 2020, 2021 smartphones that all have removable batteries. Look at this, look at this uh, consumer removable battery right here. I can just pop it right out. It's like it's 2015 or something. Um, and, and that is exciting for reasons I will talk about. Um, if you want a product that's totally glued together, uh, you know, the Samsung uh, Note options are a good option for you. Um, and I'll, I want to show kind of what where glue causes challenges. I know a lot of you see uh, see these on the, on the design side as you're making products. So let's talk about a product that has changed the world. Um, Apple AirPods, probably the best-selling gadget of, uh, of this Christmas holiday season. Uh, when we get AirPods, you know, when we look at them, we're like, okay, how do we get at the battery? How do we open these things up? Batteries are a wear item. You know, you figure you've got uh, 500 charge cycles if you're lucky. I don't actually know if Apple designed the AirPods to, for 500 charge cycles. They may be pushing the envelope and running the battery a little hotter and not going for that long. Uh, it certainly seems like in in the sort of everyone that has first-gen AirPods, uh, they're all failing around 18 months in if you use them even a moderate amount. Uh, so you'd want to replace the battery, right? Well, not so fast. The batteries are integrated in. Um, if you don't have one of these, they're pretty cool. This is a ultrasonic cutting tool that we use for uh, for cutting open plastics. We have the, the, it's hard to get them in the U.S. Uh, we had to import ours from Japan, but it makes it really easy to do uh, these kind of plastic cuts, precise plastic cuts, to try to extricate the battery. So here's what the AirPods look like pulled all the way apart. So step back and say, yeah, okay, it's a gadget, it's an AirPod. Well, what, what, what goes into making these things? Well, each AirPod has, right, the audio driver, which has rare earth elements in it probably. So those rare earths are generally not recoverable in recycling. Most of them come from one of the most polluted places in the world, um, the, uh, the uh, Baotao rare earth complex in Inner Mongolia in Northern China. Um, you've got battery here. Uh, I took, I when I first got the AirPods, I took them to, uh, the one of the most advanced and certainly the largest electronics recycler in the country and I took them apart with them and I said hey this is the the product architecture that we're seeing do you see any way that you uh, with any of your current processes could recycle this product and they said no absolutely not we don't want any product like this anywhere near our facilities um, so I would hope that all of you would maybe think a little bit when you're designing a product. Like, what are the recyclers going to think? What they're going to think here is if I have one of these things accidentally go through my shredders and that battery causes a spark and it ignites the dust from aluminum from other products from milling, I can have an explosion. That's what they're thinking. Or maybe it doesn't spark there, but it goes through and it, the, the battery ends up in the plastic fraction. So they've got all kinds of shredded plastic. It's sitting there. It's smoldering overnight with the rest of the, sort of the plastic and it lights up and it catches a, 
recycling facility on fire. Uh, and this is not academic. Um, uh, one of the uh, big municipal recycling facilities in the S San Francisco Bay Area burned to the ground a few years ago. Uh, and they have been told that if they have a single additional fire, they will never be able to get insurance for their facility again, and they'll just have to shut down recycling uh, for that particular area. Um, so this is this is a real issue, and the, it, it's product designs like this that cause these kind of challenges. Um, the, continuing on with the AirPods, this is cutting open the bottom uh, to get at the battery, right? So you got three batteries inside AirPods. Um, so these get a zero out of 10 on our scorecard. Uh, it has been widely covered in the press um, uh, you know, when people talk about planned obsolescence, they often think about AirPods sort of in the same sentence. It's a product that's designed to work and last for 18 months. Uh, I have uh, a problem with that, uh, and a lot of other folks do too. France has started rolling out repairability scoring where every product, so if your products are sold in France, uh, starting January 1st, they have to have a repairability label on them that's very similar to the iFixit scorecard from 1 to 10, how easy or hard they are to take apart. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, though, so I want to show you uh, a happy story. Uh, this is Samsung's uh, Galaxy Beans. You see our teardowns. You know that we like to have fun with photos. Um, I think that they're not actually called the Galaxy Beans. I think they're the Buds Plus or something, but uh, everyone calls them the Beans, including, I think, Samsung. One of the PCBs had a bean label on it. Um, so uh, these are functionally equivalent to the AirPods. Uh, and look at this. We have a gasket, and they just pop right open, and the battery is super easy. Oh, there you go. You can see it says Bean. Uh, left bean, right bean. Um, and there's the battery, and it's a just off-the-shelf battery. We've seen actually this particular battery used in a lot of wearables. It's made by a German manufacturer named Varda. Um, so that is a perfectly serviceable design. So same kind of net result to the consumer. Um, but let's step back and let's think about this from a manufacturing perspective. Let's say you have a manufacturing defect. Let's say instrumental shows you, you know, that you've got a problem with positioning or alignment of something. With this product, you know, rework is really straightforward. You run it, you run it back up the line, uh, or if you need to swap out any parts, uh, you're off to the races. So this is going to be a much, I think, uh, uh, easier product to achieve a high quality uh, in manufacturing, at least a low or a high yield rate than you would with a, you know, completely integrated glued together product. Where once you glue it together, uh, you're kind of done. Um, so that's that's the Surface. Let me, or, or that's the that's the buds. I want to talk to you about about the Microsoft Surface. Uh, and through the lens of a place that maybe some of you have been, if you're into anime or gadgets, you may uh, go to Tokyo's Akihabara Radio Town. Uh, before uh, before Washong Bay, this was kind of known as you know the world's electronics market. Akihabara is so cool, and the Japanese have all kinds of amazing hobbies. Uh, and so this uh, this particular store, this sign, by the way, if you don't speak Japanese, this says "Welcome to Junk World." Uh, and you go down the stairs into Junk World, and they sell all kinds of broken gadgets. Uh, and it turns out one of these crazy hobbies that Japanese people have is buying broken things and fixing them and then uh, selling them. So you see they've got like this junk labels down here. So what was in this, this table was all tablets that were broken, uh, and they're selling them uh, for people to buy them and, and fix them mostly just for fun. Uh, and if we zoom in on this sign, this says the Microsoft Surface Pro 3 which if you've never taken apart this product is quite an exciting product to disassemble. And the sign here says, hey, I fix it, uh, gave this a one out of 10. Uh, it's really hard to work on, bet you can't fix it, ha ha. And the price of these things is actually scored based on the repairability score. So the, the, the most expensive product had the highest repairability score. The cheapest products like the Microsoft Surface here um, had, had uh, lower repairability scores. And this is definitely something that we've seen. So another, you know, kind of a business argument to make for, for repairability, in addition to it being uh, you know, easier to rework, um, is that uh, the products tend to, tend to last long and they tend to have a higher resale value. Um, and so particularly if you're trying to create an ecosystem around your products, you're trying to create a you know, larger install base, um, uh, having a product that is more durable, longer lasting, uh, can work in your favor. So. I don't get uh, to be on the in the factories on the kind of assembly line like all of you do. So I, I kind of have to guess a little bit at what is going on. Um, but let's talk about the Microsoft Surface laptop um, because uh, in my mind, this is actually really the first laptop uh, out there that had a, ba a battery that wasn't designed to be replaced by anybody. Um, and so that means that the whole system was glued together. Normally when we go to open products up, I think all you do this too, you look under the feet and you say, how do I open this thing? 
Well, we went to open the Surface laptop and couldn't find any way to get inside. And so we ended up cutting away at the you know cool, elegant Alcantara cover on the top of it. We're slicing our way through this thing. We're cutting our way through the fabric. We ended up having to bust a bunch of uh, rivets or weld points uh, to finally get the upper case off. And then we could finally see the battery. Um, if you're hearing me harp on batteries a lot, uh, it's it's not because I'm crazy. It's because they're a consumable, they're a wear item. The battery in a laptop is kind of like tires in a car. And and so what, what they did here was they basically welded uh, the tires onto the car. And that is intensely frustrating to someone who wants to use their car longer than the first set of tires will last. Or in the case of a laptop, a laptop, a $2,000 laptop for more than two or three years. Very frustrating. Uh, and of course, there are rework options for these in the factory, but they're going to involve all kinds of crazy fixtures, um, you know, solvents, trying to get this thing back to pristine state once you have glued it together and you want to try to, to uh, you know, open it up again. I'm sure that was an engineering feat for the manufacturing uh, team. Uh, easier if you design it to be easier to open, easier to rework, right? So this is the original Surface laptop. And I have a feeling that the Microsoft laptop design team uh, knew that they could do better. Um, so this got a zero out of 10 on our scorecard, just like the AirPods. Um, unlike the AirPods, this is a story of redemption and hope. So let me show you the newest Surface Laptop 3. So this is the one that came out this last fall. Uh, similar, actually exactly the same industrial design, exactly the same weight, external form factor, precisely the came on, same on the Surface Laptop 3. But when you pop the foot up, there's a screw. Hey, I like screws. Screws are wonderful. We like to say screws, not glues. Um, and uh, the whole thing comes apart. And so this uh, this design, you know, they redid the mechanical design of the inside of it. They actually used magnets as an enclosure to kind of get the fitment that they wanted uh, without uh, without having to use the adhesive process they had before. And it gets a five out of 10. Uh, so this is the single largest increase in repairability score that we have seen in a single generation in any product ever. Uh, going from a zero to a five is substantial. Uh, there's more work that we'd like to see them do, but this is a product uh, that is not designed for the dump. It's it's going to outlast its its original battery, and that's a really great thing. Uh, and also, it's going to be much more straightforward to recycle. Um, what, one thing we hear regularly from uh, secure facilities is they're like, "Hey, we need to be able to separate the storage from the rest of the product. Otherwise, otherwise, like imagine the Department of Energy National Labs type situation. If you have storage in your product and it's not separable from the product." Uh, the only secure way uh, to prove that that data is erased is to destroy the whole product, which is kind of sad. So what are some strategies that you can use in your design to make things a little more repairable? Honest, I, I'll, go, I'll go through a lot of these, but I would say you all kind of know these things. I mean, if, if you imagine it, uh, repairability is simply a process that can be undone. So if you have snap fits that don't come open again, or that are very challenging to come open again, or you're gluing something using a you know, optically clear adhesive that is not, um, uh, you know, undoable with or or heat soluble, heat sensitive, uh, then it causes a problem. Um, one one issue that we run into all the time uh, is kind of assume that the people doing the repairs are going to make mistakes, just like people assembling products are going to make mistakes. Uh, there is a class of repairs on the iPhone that we call long screw damage. And it's caused by Apple using like a 1.5 millimeter screw in one place and a 1.0 millimeter screw in another place. And imagine the person doing the repair swaps them accidentally. And then that longer screw goes through and, you know, cuts through a trace on another board. Uh, that kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, Dell and HP actually do a really great job with this. They label all the screws inside the product, which we like a lot. Sanitization of parts uh, is, is, is a big help. Um, you can do innovative things. I have been accused uh, in advocating for repair. I've been accused of advocating against progress. Uh, you just want the industry to stay the way it's always been. No, I don't think that's the case at all. What Microsoft did with the Surface Laptop 3, they, they, they replaced a uh, glued process with magnets. That's really cool. It's innovative. Uh, it's a way to push the industry forward, achieve the industrial design goals that they had while making things serviceable. Uh, same thing, this is Apple with the... Um, so these are the pull uh, stretch adhesive strips. You can go to Home Depot and buy 3M command adhesive, uh, and and that'll work for that. Uh, both Tesla and uh, and 3M have a wide variety of options like this for you. Um, I, we love seeing these. Uh, we wish that that Samsung and other folks would do the same thing. I mean, in this case, we are literally using a suction cup to remove a battery because you know we don't want to apply force on on the edge of the battery. 
uh, this is a, a frustrating adhesive technique. Uh, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, there, there are other ways. Uh, we don't, by the way, mind using a heat to loosen things. Um, uh, as, as long as it's within reason, we'll also use solvents and, and other tools and, and consumers and repair shops are accustomed to that. Um, here is the OnePlus. Uh, this is, they attempted to make the, the adhesive easier by making you be able to pull on the battery and uh, pull the across. Uh, so this was an attempt at, at uh, improving serviceability on the battery and we found like it was a little bit better than the Samsung approach, but it really wasn't great. Um, Minimizing the number of fasteners. Man, we just took apart the new AirPods, um, the over the uh, Air, AirPods, and what a crazy product. I, I, don't, I don't have them here to show you, but uh, incredible mechanical engineering went into that thing. Uh, so over-designed, it's ludicrous. Uh, really, really, really cool. Everybody is saying $550 for a pair of headphones, what? And then you get these things, you take them apart, and you're like, wow, okay, I see where the $550 went. Uh, unfortunately, in order to do that and achieve the, the, the design form factor that they had, they really used a ton of fasteners. We were blown away. Like, we looked at our workbench at the end of that, that teardown. We're like, we have like 15 screwdrivers out here. What in the world is going on? Um, and so that that takes time, right? Imagine in a, in a uh, commercial repair process, maybe in your repair depot or in a, um, in a you know, retail repair setting, Speed, time is money, right? And so every time you have a tool change, that adds uh, that, that's cost. It also you know, adds complexity on the manufacturing side. So uh, keeping things simple, um, uh, making things intuitive, uh, trying to think about, you know, we think about intuitive design from the folks using our products. Well, can we make it intuitive to disassemble? I've got the Fairphone here. Uh, and uh, they, they have, you know, cool things. But they also, they made the design a little semi-transparent. And they actually, um, they label all the components inside so the camera will point it and say, hey, this is the camera module. These are the three screws to remove. So that's pretty cool. Uh, information also is key. Having service information, schematics available for people really helps. Um, I want to uh, give props to Motorola for a second. Uh, Motorola is the only cell phone manufacturer, only mainstream cell phone manufacturer, in addition, I think, to some of these guys, like Fairphone does this as well, that is selling service parts uh, to consumers. So if you think about you make a product, you sell it, uh, you have a support ecosystem and a, and a part supply chain plan for the first 12 months for, for warranties. Well, what happens after that? Well, Motorola has really stepped up and they're, um, uh, we're working with them to, to sell uh, uh, repair kits. You can get a screen and all the, uh, the tools uh, to throw a, new, um, throw a new screen on your you know, Moto G or Moto Z. Um, so that's really neat that Motorola is doing that. Uh, we've seen other folks doing this. HTC is doing that with the Vive. Uh, they're now starting to sell service parts for their Vive headsets. Uh, you know, Fairphone obviously is doing this. Uh, for you know, uh, Motorola, I'm sorry, uh, HP and Dell and Lenovo do this already for for pretty much their entire product line. They're selling parts. Um, you may not know this, but there is a uh, legal requirement in California that you have to provide service for seven years for your product. Uh, and an easy way to fulfill that requirement is just to sell people the parts so that independent shops uh, can perform that service. So with that, I am going to pause. And since unlike some of the previous uh, uh, folks, I am live. I can answer questions. I don't have any NDAs or anything. Uh, this is sort of the cool thing about being iFixit. It's my company. Uh, I can say what I want, as you can tell, about any product and anything we've ever taken apart. So I am all yours for questions. Uh, no filter. Uh, and uh, happy to take something apart. Uh, and while I wait for questions to come in, uh, I have I have here. So this, I'll, I'll I'll pull out parts, and we'll see. Can someone tell me tell me what this is? It's obviously pretty pretty obvious. This is a game uh, controller, right? But which game controller is it? And why is a repair guy talking about this game controller on the what the third week in February, 2021? I'm just gonna keep pulling parts out until someone in the chat says what this product is is a ps5 controller yes but which ps5 controller there are more than one yeah it's not the stadia although that would be cool i have a bracket you guys haven't been reading your gadget news this week uh look at this i've got a battery that seems very modular and removable uh let's see this is a 1560 milliamp controller rumble 5 this is the new uh, uh sony dual sense controller so this is the one that everyone has been has been raving about. This is supposed to be the best game controller, as I'm dropping parts, the best game controller ever invented. Uh, and of course, you know, Sony has been making these for a long time. 
They packed everything they possibly could into this. It's incredibly high tech. It's incredibly complex. Okay, so uh, imagine you know you waited uh, in line for months. You pre-ordered. You got your PS5. Uh, you've got the fancy DualSense controller just in time for Christmas. You've been playing it for a month. Uh, and what is happening? Uh, well, the same thing is happening to these uh, these PlayStations that is happening to the Nintendo uh, uh, Switch. Uh, we're having Joy-Con drift. So the 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 uh, joysticks will start to drift, and it's like the most infuriating thing. You're playing the video game, and your character just keeps going that way, and you can't stop. Uh, and with a like high-end console like this, it's a problem. So this is the mechanical part inside. So this is the joystick, you know, thing. Uh, and so this is the mechanical part that fails. Unfortunately uh, for Sony, <laughs> since all of these are under warranty, uh, this part is soldered on. And so they, people have to mail in the whole thing. They have to disassemble them. They're going to have to unsolder these from the board, replace these parts, solder them back on. Uh, the Joy-Con design, it's not soldered on. Uh, it's, it's a part, it's a flex connector, uh, and boom, you're off to the races. So I fix it has sold, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of Nintendo Joy-Con uh, fix kits for consumers to do the repairs themselves. Uh, this uh, repair involves uh, a rework station and a little bit more work. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, I th this is the new PS5 controller that has the drift in it. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's the this is uh, Sony probably wishing right now that they had designed this thing to be more. So I mean, of course, they're wishing that the part didn't have the defect in the first place. Uh, but secondarily, they are wishing that uh, they had not soldered this on. Um, and that was the case um, to pick on Microsoft again. The Microsoft Xbox 360 had the very common red ring of death problem. Microsoft, extent, it was a it was a heating overheating issue from an overly ambitious uh, thermal design or an undersized thermal design. Uh, and so they had, they had uh, ICs separating on the graphics chip. And unfortunately for them, the Xbox 360 was designed, it just was a lot of steps to assemble, a lot of steps to disassemble. And so pretty much every Xbox 360 that Microsoft made, they ended up having to make it assemble at once, send it to customers, have them send it back, take it apart again, fix it, put it back together. Like how many times do you have to do this before you start to say, okay, maybe design for repair, design for rework makes sense. Um, question, have we ever taken something apart that has not been released? Uh, yes, but I'm under NDA, so I can't answer that question, sorry. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, we work, we work with, with manufacturers. Um, what is a product that we've wanted to take apart but haven't been able to? Uh, the teardown I want to do right now is the Model Y. Uh, so if anyone wants to loan me theirs, I'm 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 game. <laughs> uh, yeah, we haven't done a whole lot of auto teardowns just uh, due to expense and size of our, our lab and everything. That that would really be fun. Um, but in general, like any gadget that I have ever wanted, like we just buy and we have. I've got one of everything here uh, in our labs, like in our library. We have a teardown library. We have. Pretty much one of every device that uh, most electronics manufacturers have released in the last 15 years. We did the we did the Hololens. We did the um, uh, the Magic Leap. That was a fun teardown. Um, Michael wants to know what is the what, what how many repairs are do the water ingress as a percent of repair events? Waterproofing is table stakes these days. Wonder if it's worth it to PSA everything together. Yeah, so it totally depends on what you're talking about. Uh, I don't think the Amazon Echoes are waterproof, and I don't think they necessarily need to be. Um, that's a pretty darn reliable, durable product without waterproofing. Uh, with a phone, yeah, this is a factor. Uh, and I mean, I don't have a number for you in terms of percentages. Um, obviously, it's substantial with mobile devices. With, with laptops, like there really aren't waterproof laptops out there, very many. Uh, so it's not table stakes for those, although certainly if there's things that you can do, um, to make it better, it helps. Uh, I I like some of these, some of the the approaches to waterproofing that don't involve like uh, you know aggressive glue on the outside. Some of the nano coatings are really cool. Uh, we've seen both Samsung and Apple tinkering with these nano coatings on the boards. Uh, and what's great about the nano coatings is they're reworkable. You you can you know, access, you can test them after the the uh, nano coating has been applied, and and everything is still fine. Um, I wish that we would see uh, those kind of nano coatings in, say, like I have an instant on hot water heater and it's got a massive circuit board and they have the very expensive glue on every component to right, really encase it. Well, did you have to do that or could you use a nano coating that then would be equally waterproof but also more reworkable? Um, 
what is my advice to uh, consumers on getting customers more interested in products built to be repaired? Well, that's a marketing challenge, right? Uh, my, uh, HP is the is the largest uh, electronics or uh, you know computer manufacturer in the world. Across the board, they generally design their products to be repaired. And if you look in their environmental reports, they brag about it. If you look at their marketing to uh, to businesses and IT organizations, they brag about that a lot. Uh, with consumer devices, I think you have to, you know, start talking life cycle and, and, and compare, you know, get people to compare total cost of ownership. Uh, if you want to really get into the weeds on this or convince your marketing people, there's a conference coming up. It will be virtual. It's called the Plate Conference, P-L-A-T-E, Product Lifetimes in the Environment. And the conference is full of academic behavioral psychologists who study this question. And they've done extensive surveys where they've they've gone to consumers and they've said, hey, would you buy a washing machine that was $300? Uh, but was only going to last two years, or would you spend $400 and buy one that would last five years? Uh, and they have fantastic data. Uh, what it shows is that if consumers have the information at purchase time, they will skew toward the more repairable, longer lasting product. Uh, France, before they rolled out their repairability index, uh, they did a study of, you know, they put two laptops on the shelf and, and everything is the same, uh, price is the same, everything, you know, one has a higher repairability score, consumers go for that do price experiments. So this is, it's starting to be more and more well understood. I would say, honestly, I think the consumer electronics marketing folks are a little bit out of step with reality and what people are actually experiencing on the ground. Um, people really care about how, how long things last and, and they get really frustrated when things, when things break on them and there isn't a, a repair option. Uh, Jeff is a big nanocutting fan as well. We can we can geek out about nanocuttings all the time. If you don't know what we're talking about, if you look at the board and there's like a rainbow sheen on it and it looks cool, like a unicorn attacked it or something, that's a nanocutting. Uh, what's the most dangerous thing we've ever taken apart? <laughs> Probably one of those hoverboards in the early days, right? Those things that never went through any UL testing. And yeah, we were probably a little bit sketched out by having those things in our in our facility. Maybe we'll take those apart outside. Um, dangerous. Uh, aside from that, I would say, you know, like the AirPods, uh, we, we bled, like we were trying to open the AirPods before we got that ultrasonic cutter that I showed you. And, uh, we cut ourselves and slipped on. So we, it was like white and red AirPods, just blood all over the table. It was bad. Uh, so in terms of dangerous to us, where we actually hurt ourselves, it was, it was having to cut open AirPods. Um, what product have we most enjoyed taking apart? I would say, okay, so my all time favorite, uh, thing that we have ever taken apart is the Pleo dinosaur. Um, and Pleo, this is going back quite a ways, but this is a really cool, innovative um, company. And I'll post the link and this will be my last answer. But Pleo the robot dinosaur was absolutely adorable. A mechanical design marvel. Uh, it had fully articulating, 360 articulating tail. And it was designed where a kid would pick it up by the tail and it would start crying. It had accelerometers and cameras and binaural hearing. Really, really neat. Uh, and the tail design was just so cool. It was based on, you know, actual skeletons. Uh, full 360 articulated movement in the tail with two control wires and a single motor. Absolutely amazing, phenomenal design. It was just a little bit too expensive and early for its time. But I, I would I would love to have a world with more animatronic dinosaurs. Uh, so please stop making whatever you're making and make more dinosaurs. That's it. I'm going to I'm going to stop now. It's uh, it's 530. But thank you so much for your time. Uh, check out our teardowns online. Fix it.